I call this meeting to order at 10 o'clock. Um, we have, are there any announcements? Okay. We have no resolutions and proclamations and we have no hearings, so we are me moving immediately to our first action item, which is the state station road bridge funding. Um, I have asked um, Councillor Andy Steinberg to make the recommendations and we'll move then to approvals. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, making a motion on the station road bridge funding item number one and then I uh, want to make one comment on uh, the, something said at the public forum just to, for clarification purposes, though it does flow from the written report that we've already presented. The motion I'm making is to appropriate $212,500 for the purchase and installation of a temporary bridge for the Station Road Hopbrook Bridge and to meet such appropriation transfer $212,500 from free cash or um, period. Is there a second? Shalini, is the second? Are there comments? Andy. Yeah. So the, the one thing that I was going to say about this is that um, the question arose during the public comments at the forum about the effect on other projects. Um, and uh, th this was a topic that was referred referred to in the Finance Committee report. This was not something that <clears throat> we did not think about. We certainly did think about it. And I made reference to the fact that we talked about how major project funding would work for funding for major projects, which is a topic that the Council is going to be coming back to with, um, over the next uh, several meetings. But basically, uh, the, any plan to fund uh, that number of major projects and the uh, plan that had been in place from uh, last year um, and the year before, which was uh, part of the um, proposal that had gone forward about the elementary school that was then rejected at town meeting on the bonding relied on four parts. One was his reference seeking grants wherever possible to pay for as much of uh, our projects as um, can be funded in this uh, situation, the bridge grant. And then of course, we've talked about MSBA and the Mass Board of Library Commissioners funding. The second piece of it is that uh, we um, as a community and uh, do what any business and most homeowners do is you manage your debt and as you pay off some debt that frees up the capacity to take on other debt because you've built in repayment within the budget. It's part of the capital budget and uh, as uh, we have a number of projects that uh, we've had in the past that had uh, funding attached to them that are expiring and that gives us the capacity to borrow additional funds for taking on new projects. So that was uh, a second element. The third is the use of reserves and uh, um, it had been the policy over a number of years that we had been strategically building up our free cash and stabilization fund in order to have money available to uh, fund the projects that we're talking about, which then left the last piece, which is that some segment of it um, will have to be um, a, as an additional request to our taxpayers in a debt exclusion override to um, take on um, the additional debt that cannot otherwise be covered. And of course, um, as we probably all know, the uh, debt exclusion override was passed by the voters um, prior to the town meeting, multiple votes and then the reconsideration by the voters. And um, so the, the debt exclusion had passed, but the uh, town meeting has said that they still did not want to borrow the funds. Um, 
as we take money out of reserves of a significant amount, that's going to put pressure on that whole schematic that I just described and probably require that we have to ask for slightly more funds in debt exclusion override. Um, and that's something that uh, Mr. Mangano is going to help us analyze and understand in the future. Um, but the Station Road Bridge we were looking at on the Finance Committee is an entire package of a permanent bridge to be funded uh, to the maximum extent possible by the Small Bridge Grant Program, the remaining funded out of town funds. And uh, the uh, uh, taking, uh, so, so it's, you know, the, the decision to replace um, a bridge um, is uh, going to be somewhere around $750,000 of additional money that is going to have to come from other pieces within the entire planning for um, any, um, for the other major projects. Uh, nonetheless, uh, knowing that the committee uh, presented the recommendation that it presented. Um, I'm going to add two comments. The motions we're dealing with today do not provide the funds that will match the state money we hope to get for the permanent bridge. That comes later. That was part of what uh, Andy was pointing out. The other thing is just in a broad picture that I think is very important to those of you that are here and those of you that are listening and others as well, the council will really be focusing, focusing on capital projects for the month of February. On our meeting on February 11th, we will actually be reviewing with the major people representing the library, DPW, fire. We will not have the schools come back since they have already been here and we're involved in quite a process with them. So we'll be learning about where those projects are, how they would move forward, and what is required. The next meeting, which is 14 days later, therefore on February 25th, we will actually be looking at a option of how we would have, have to move forward to fund those projects and what the impact of those projects and that funding would be on taxpayers. So we think this is an opportune time not only for the council to be educated on these issues, but also for the public to be educated on these issues. And it's just the beginning of that process. So other comments on this motion? Yes, Dorothy. Um, I'd like some clarification. Um, at the Finance Committee, I guess my understanding was that we voted to uh, recommend going ahead on the temporary bridge and that any decision on the permanent bridge would come after we did uh, get a go ahead on uh, state matching funds, but that at that point we would then take a vote. It's the, for example, if we did get funds from the state for part of it, we would at that point make the vote on the permanent bridge. Am I incorrect? No, you're correct. Okay. Because yeah. sometimes it sounds as if we have recommended the permanent bridge. We just said we would go ahead on the temporary bridge. Kathy. Uh, that, that was actually my comment, but I just urge it. It's, it's written in the document as well. We did not make a decision right. on the permanent bridge. Right. Correct. Shalini? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Mandy Jo. So before we actually vote on this, I wanted to make a few comments about where my decision process was, because this was actually a hard decision for me. Um, it's more expensive than I think we thought it would be, and so that we heard that in public comments. But I also wanted to acknowledge that some of us counselors, I, I know I received public comments through email that advocated both sides of this, funding and not funding a temporary bridge. And so I wanted to put that out there that, that some of us have heard both sides um, and advocates for both sides of that and acknowledge that we had a lot of comments on this issue that may not have been seen by the public. My thinking was who bears the cost of this, just the users? or the entire set of taxpayers. And that's one of the things that I've been considering as we're looking at all of this. But before we vote, I wanna say, I think the closing of the Station Road Bridge 
exposed a number of shortcomings in our town, and we heard some of those comments. Shortcomings on the detour routes, an unpaved road that is a major detour. If we do close this, if the station road is closed, the detour routes are not necessarily safe, and we need to be considering that as we look to planning infrastructure-wise as a whole. I think that we shouldn't take this vote and say we're done, that we need to consider things in the future, um, and that planning on infrastructure in general needs to be better, and we should take that to heart ourselves. Um, in the end, and my vote, I, I, looking at the numbers as um, one public commenter talked about in terms of cost and all, I think I'm to the point where it should be, it's a major enough road, a major enough route that it should be the entire taxpayer base that bears the cost of that, not just those 1,100 cars that use it a day. Thank you. Yes, Sarah. So I think I feel the same way as Mandy Joe is that I had a process in my head of which the way my vote is going. And I would like to say, formally of being part of a finance committee, that I believe that I respect all of the work that the finance committee has done. And I do believe, like generally, if the finance committee says something, they've thought it through. And, and I feel it's, for the most part, disrespectful to go against what finance committee has said. However, I would like to, to point out the fact that we're talking about sort of where money comes from and what pockets you know we draw from for certain things. So the process right now is if somehow the town figures out and again, I feel like it's not completely clear how they constitute something an emergency or a priority over similarly funded projects in the town, and we're taking them one by one. And if you take them one by one, there's no way to actually look at, say, you know, five other projects that are similar, right, and to make a priority list and to look at it as how to make a priority of those five projects, right? So I'm just using that number. Um, when you take that money out of the, that pot, out of that bucket, it's gone. So that's one thing I want to say, is if you're just taking one thing at a time, there's no way to prioritize mm -hmm. other similar projects. I will say that also in my district, we have the intersection with Meadow Street and Pine Street. And um, so all of the things that people brought up, and I, I'm not saying that this project is not important, because I agree, agree that it is. However, at that intersection, that intersection, as you know, is one of the most dangerous. Um, that intersection is rated an, an F out of a A is great, F is bad, okay? Um, so we have that. Um, if you're trying to get from 116 at, from, to my house, which is right at the, the lights at that intersection, I have waited up to five to 10 minutes, and that's just one way. So if we're talking about emissions, that's huge. Also, that light has been hit. I mean, it's gone. It's not the first time that's been hit. So it's dangerous in the fact that if you're trying to take a left turn from Meadow Street going towards like the mini malls and such, people are trying to get, there's no light that is paused so that you can get across that intersection. Everybody just gets a go and everybody goes for it. So that's why people are just making ch like just chancy moves to try to get through and it's really dangerous. Also, <laughs> trying to get through, it's, it's such a weight that it, it affects the library, it affects the mini mall, it affects the mill district. Um, we're on it, 63 and 116 hook up through that intersection, so you've got highways. Um, and right now, the trips that we have a day through there, um, are roughly 6,000. The Beacon Project should be up and opening this summer, which would add approximately uh, 5,000 trips a day, I believe. 25, 25,000 trips a day. 2,500 trips a day, thank you, to that. So just what I'm saying is, is, is not, I'm not advocating one part of the town over another, or that should never be. I'm just saying, looking at the process, I think it would be better if there was a way for a deciding committee to be able to see all projects at okay. once. So, um, thank you very much. And in fact, in between our public forum today 
and the calling of this meeting, I, Guilford, just hold on to your hat, okay? Um, I asked Mr. Bachman to add to our agenda on the 11th a review of these other types of projects that are out there and have significant uh, financial implications as well as public safety and convenience imp implications for the town. So that, that review, which is an ongoing list, will also be available, particularly because there are people in town who suggest that the fifth capital project is in fact our infrastructure. So I hope that we will have many more opportunities to address exactly that project and others that we see on the list. Are there other comments on this motion? Yes, Shalini. I think um, I just want to uh, emphasize also I agree with having a common set of criteria for how we're prioritizing. So. Uh, and also how difficult it was for me because I am on the finance committee and I'm also district five counselor and to balance and make sure that I'm, while I'm taking care of the needs of district five residents, I'm being fair to the rest of the town. And some of the criteria that, um, that I looked at, how do we prioritize this was in speaking to some of the businesses, Al Camelito and Atkins, and how they're getting affected, and uh, looking at the residents, and some of the figures have been added, and just taking very conservative figures, it, it amounted to, if the delay is by two years, we have two million um, extra miles, which is taking very average figures, um, it's $250,000 um, extra gas money that residents are paying. Uh, where, you know, of this particular neighborhood. And this is, again, not to deny that there are other projects that are not important. I think this issue has highlighted that we need that process. But it is not to, again, say that this is not urgent. Um, so I just want to emphasize that. And um, I think most of the points have been made, but the real estate aspects, the houses that are trying to sell right now in these areas and they're not being sold, or the emergency aspects, which again, we've heard the doctor and I reached out to emergency doctors as well. And again, they emphasize that from balloon to, um, you know, from door to balloon, the time has to be minimized. So, you know, it could be just one resident who's a you know, whose life could be affected. So do, are we willing to take that chance? So, I mean, these are the criteria that I went through, and it was a very difficult decision, but I strongly um, feel that we should um, move ahead with the temporary bridge. And at the same time, let's take this opportunity while it's still fresh in everybody's minds to work towards um, looking at our infrastructure and preempting and having a plan for that. Are there additional comments that add information to this discussion? Let me, before we move on, say thank you to the Finance Committee. Although a member of it, I have to say, the deliberative process was most educational. And the presentations provided to us were also extremely helpful. I'll call the question. All those in favor of the motion that Mr. Steinberg has put before us, please raise your hand. We have, do you want a roll call vote? Okay, there are all of us except for one, no. Sarah is a no. Okay. We'll move to this, are you ready, Margaret? Okay, move to the second motion, Andy. Second motion is to appropriate $227,500 to reimburse the road repair account for the engineering service costs incurred for the station road hop work bridge replacement and to meet such appropriation transfer $227,500 from free cash. Is there a second? Uh, Councillor Pam, Councillor Dorothy Pam. <laughs> um, the only comment I'm going to make here is to point out that the money that was spent on this, the vast majority, is absolutely applicable to a new permanent bridge as long as we build that permanent bridge within five years. And then we may have to redo some of this so it's not money that was done just for the temporary but also for the permanent. 
other conversation about this motion? Call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Um, we have one other action item, and it is the Pioneer Valley Metropolitan Planning Organization. This is an organization that um, has representations by clusters of towns. The town cluster that we belong to includes East Hampton, North Hampton, um, Hadley, South Hadley, and Amherst. Uh, we are very fortunate that because the mayor of Northampton is the chair of the advisory board for the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, he automatically gets to sit on this commission. This is the group that looks at road allocations, um, transportation issues, etc. Uh, and therefore, there are three candidates for this position. Um, up at this point, one is a select person from South Hadley, the other, another person is the mayor of East Hampton, and the third person is myself as president of this council. Um, is there a motion? We do need to vote to put this motion forward. Andy? I move to support Lynn Grishmer to uh, as Northern Tier representative to the MPO And I guess that I want, uh, as the maker of the motion, uh, Doug Slaughter is the chair of the select board, has been the most recent person in that role. It has been extremely important for this community, which is the, uh, by population, largest community in the county, in New Hampshire County, to be uh, represented on the MPO. Um, the, representation that he provided and the information that he was able to bring back to the select board was invaluable to this community, both to the select board and to the town manager. And uh, furthermore, as I looked at the qualifications of the uh, three candidates, I think that uh, we are, uh, my motion is to support the person who is the most qualified. Are there other comments? I want to be very clear. I am not a transportation specialist, but I have spent a lot of my career around issues related to transportation as they relate to employment, uh, economic development, and so forth. And if I am selected in this pretty tough race, I look forward to representing ta Amherst very well, okay. and our and the five towns. Uh, we are moving on. Oh, we need a vote. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I uh, call the question. All those in favor? Thank you. Opposed? No. Nothing. All right, we're moving on to presentations. Um, Mr. Bockelman has asked various members of the town to complete in a rapid fire motion manner, uh, our education of town departments. So uh, again, I think this is an opportunity for the community to be uh, ed educated as well. And let me just say one thing. While we as a council are in our, our own process of um, being a new body of government, one of the things that has been most helpful to all of us is that we actually have a town that has continued to operate all around us. We have a police department, we have a fire department, we have a school department, we have IT, and we have many, many other departments. And so it's not as if we took a pause and had no services in Amherst, but under Mr. Bockelman's guidance and the superintendent of schools and so forth, we have continued to have terrific services in Amherst during this transition period. So, Mr. Bockelman, you wanna take over? Yes, yeah, so this morning we have six departments who are going to present. We've allocated them 15 minutes each and they have about 40 minutes to discuss. They're gonna, they're gonna talk super fast and um, I think if you have a, a question or two at the end, but I think the chair will be uh, having a, a a firm hold on the timing because I know you've already been here an hour and we, you want to, there's a, you have a limit. So the first up is IT. 
and Sean Hannon is the director. Good morning. So with uh, two thirds of the IT department here, we're, uh, we have about 15 slides in 15 minutes, so we're going to be about a minute per slide. This one is going to come in under a minute. So um, <clears throat> we're uh, a six-person department. So um, I think most of you have met most of the department. But I'm Sean Hannon. I'm the IT director. Um, in our department, we have Rich Dukevich, our information specialist, Bill Glover, who's up here, our network administrator, James Saltis, our newest hire, uh, who's also an information specialist, Brianna Sunrid, our communications manager, who's here, and Mike Warner, our application manager. When you add it all up, we have 63 years of service with the town between the six of us. Um, just to give you a sense of who we serve, um, we serve essentially all town departments, um, the schools as well. We provide internet connection for them. Um, we also serve Amherst Media, um, their phone system, the um, phone system for some of the tenants over at the Bang Center, um, and um, obviously uh, the council and other boards and committees. We use a ticket system for uh, support requests that come in. Last calendar year, we had 3,248 support tickets. Um, with us supporting the um, public safety organizations, we uh, have somebody who rotates um, being on call 24-7. So if the communication center has a problem, they call usually one of these three people at 2 in the morning and get it fixed. Um, <clears throat> For the presentation, we kind of have uh, three, three roles here that we're going to talk about. Bill's going to talk about the infrastructure, which essentially is the, the plumbing that kind of connects everything together, connects everything. Um, Mike's going to talk about the application side of things, which is basically what the users end up interacting with. And then Brianna, um, with the recent change uh, we had in our department taking on the communication role. She's going to talk about the communication and outreach um, part that IT has taken a more active role in. So first we have uh, Bill Glover. Yeah. Good morning, and uh, thanks for uh, listening to us today. So my name is Bill Glover. I've been with the town for 15 years. I've worked in local government for about 20. I work with a team of three, um, so primarily I work with Rich um, and James uh, on a daily basis. We're very busy, um, but it doesn't, we're not siloed. Uh, we all work together. We're, we're divided between infrastructure and software, but it's a team environment where we all kind of lend a hand if we're busy or somebody's out, that type of thing. Um, like Sean mentioned, uh, I'm kind of the, the plumber that you would call if you have a, a pipe that is broken or your electricity doesn't work at your house. Um, we work on systems that often go unnoticed until they break. So if somebody's phone doesn't work, your internet, internet doesn't work, uh, your laptops that you're using right now don't work, uh, they call IT. And that's something that we, uh, we take care of. Um, so house comparison usually works pretty well because you know, it kind of simplifies it. Um, like I said, we have very busy days. Um, we, where are we here? So we have uh, a pretty large uh, infrastructure compared to a lot of different towns. Uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about on the next slide is an upcoming product um, project. Uh, we're doing a Windows 10 upgrade. So I'll just highlight on this slide that we have 558 computers. But one thing that I do want to speak to is that um, we're very proud of our internal skill set. We do a lot of things internally in this town that a lot of other towns will hire out. So that's one thing I just wanted to highlight on that. And another thing that I wanted to talk about just really briefly is we're always trying to innovate. We're always trying to learn new, new technology. Uh, we're not staying in place. We're constantly trying to move ahead. Um, so this is the recent and upcoming infrastructure projects that I was um, alluding to on the first uh, slide there. So in green is the ones that we've completed and the town room technology upgrade obviously you guys are very aware of and obviously we're very proud of that that was done in a t very short time frame um, and it's turned out uh, amazingly well and that was a team effort led by sean and but it was a whole uh, entire group um, collaborating to get it done on time under a lot of stress um, 
And then the last thing I just wanted to talk to you, because we, we don't have a lot of time, but the Microsoft Windows 10 PC upgrade. There's a, a deadline of January 2020 that we have to be on Microsoft 10. They're not supporting legacy systems of Windows anymore. So there's a hard and fast deadline that we have to meet. So with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Mike. Hi, good morning, everyone. I think I've met or interacted with most of you. Um, <clears throat> I am the applications manager for the town, um, and what that means is once the plumbing's all settled and you come in and you sit down at your computer every day, what tool do you use on your computer to do your daily job, whether it's a Microsoft Word or an Excel or something as complicated as the financial system or for emergency responders, the patient care reports that they fill out in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. Those are the sort of things that the application team kind of supports. And like Bill mentioned, it's a team effort. Bill maintains applications for the police department and Brianna, as she'll talk about later, manages a lot of communications applications. Like Bill mentioned, um, on the application side of things, we do a lot here in town that a lot of other communities contract out for, specifically with product selection. So. We often hear when we're working with a, a department, oh, this isn't working for us, or can you help us find a new way to do this? Well, we handhold those departments through the process from conducting a needs assessment to procurement to implementation. Um, and we'll highlight a few projects where we're actively involved in that right now. Um, we're involved with, in training different um, users around town hall, and all of the software applications that we maintained store in massive databases around town. So what we try to do is tie all of those databases together so that they can communicate with each other. Um, and one of the major applications that we have in town that we're very proud of is Amherst Maps. As residents of town, you may have seen it or used it. Um, we're nationally recognized for it and have a great reputation in the Northeast for our mapping application. Um, we have 40 plus interactive maps. Um, our most popular is our parcel map where you can go online and get your property card or check your assessment values over time um, to the voting map that's embedded on each and one of your uh, council members web page that shows where your district is and where your po local polling places are. Um, to parking maps or trail maps so that people who are from out of town want to find a trail to hike on or a place to park, they can pull it up on their mobile device and see um, where they can park and how much it is. And then on the other side of the interactive is data collection. So, and it's specifically for public works, they have a lot of guys who are just out in the field all day long working on trees or water and sewer pipes or street signs that get knocked over um, there's a, they can, there was a water main break on Main Street about a two week, two or three weeks ago. Those guys don't even have to show up to the office. They can go right out, use their phone, pull up maps, make edits, make changes, and grab all the information that they need. So we provide a lot of those tools. Um, and for, as for uh, recent and upcoming projects that we're currently working on, um, we're working on a police scheduling software for the de police department. They have uh, incredible union rules that they have to sort, and um, they're doing it all by paper and by hand right now, and it takes a tremendous amount of time and effort to do that. So we found a software solution. That was a perfect example of us hand-holding them through the whole process and identifying um, exactly what they need. And one major project that we're, the applications team is working on right now is the permitting system replacement. So to be able to provide members of the public the ability to fill out for a permit online um, instead of having to come into the office um, and fill out a piece of paper and pay, you can pay online. So we're actively involved in that process right now. Um, it's a very big project that touches many different departments. It's very complicated. Um, and it's definitely one of those that you traditionally see in other communities that's contracted out. So. That's something that we're working on. Um, 
if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out there, but I'll hand it over to Brianna for the communication side of things. Good morning, counselors. Thank you for your time and attention. I've met most of you and had an opportunity to uh, work one-on-one -on -one with m many of you, so um, look forward to working closer with everybody. So what I'm gonna talk about today is communications and outreach, uh, basically the public information side of things. What Mike and I do does frequently overlap and where it differs um, kind of falls under my umbrella is if it's public facing um, or web-based. So one of the main things that I focus on now and um, will continue to focus on now in my new role is supporting and maintaining the town websites, public information, um, social media, news and announcements. Um, I won't go through the whole list, but these are just kind of a samplings of projects that fall under the umbrella of a communications manager. This is just a quick snapshot, um, some numbers. I know people love numbers. We, we have seven websites, actually, that we maintain. Um, you can see some of our metrics for our website visits um, from the last fiscal year, a number which we're hoping to increase um, with one of the projects I'll mention in the next slide. We have nearly 7,000 web notification subscribers. I'm sure um, everybody at this table is on one or more of our, oh, Councillor Pam's not. Okay, we'll get you there. Um, we have an emergency alert system, which luckily we haven't had to activate too often, but when we do, we have 5, 000, almost 5,000 subscribers, and that's a, a, a terrific tool for us to activate a, a message um, in an emergency situation that will go out to the subscribers instantaneously, robocall them, email them, text them, post to our social media. It's a, it's a very robust tool. Luckily, we haven't had to use it, but... Um, we have it if we need it. So we have nearly 2,500 followers on social media. I know that a lot of you um, have liked and shared some of our posts, and we thank you for that. Um, we hope to increase that number as part of our communication strategy as well. We have a, a community calendar that we're proud of. We have a big sub subscription base to that where um, members of the public can post to, to share community happenings. Um, and we've held roughly six community outreach specific events where we've been tabling on behalf of the town, talking about communication tools, um, public safety tools, and we hope that number grows um, in this next year. And we did start tracking about a year ago um, outreach specific support tickets, and so our number is ticking up there. You'll see we've got about 250 support tickets, and that's of the total that Sean mentioned earlier, um, 3,248 for the year, and I think we just crossed the 10,000 ticket mark. So, so recent and upcoming projects, again, um, just something that we will, in the recent past, we've just um, updated a applicant tracking software and a, a public facing jobs portal, which just makes it a lot easier for the public to learn about and apply to jobs for the town. We hope to expand that to um, internship opportunities and also um, boards and committee vacancies to make that process smoother. One of the big things that I'll touch on, I won't touch on all of these, but one of the major things that we're hoping to accomplish in the next six months to a year is a complete website redesign. And that's not just about aesthetics. Um, it's really to improve navigation, to improve searchability, make it easier for our community members to access information, and to make sure that we're maintaining ADA compliance and going above and beyond those standards. The next one, which you'll probably uh, be involved with at some point, is a legislative management solution. And I know Margaret over there is probably jumping up and down out of her seat. Nope, she's smiling. Um, that solution is gonna be really important to many stakeholders in the process, the, the staff in the town manager's office for agenda prep, town clerk staff for meeting management and minute management, and also will have um, benefits for the town councilors or any other boards and committees who happen to um, use that solution to better access their documents and take notes and um, basically a tool to improve your experience during, before, during, and after meetings. And I will take one second to just mention down below that I am part of the community participation officer team, as you most know. Um, so we're getting started on some great work for that. And we are um, working with a student from the School of Public Policy who's come on board with us in the last week, whom I hope to introduce most of you to, to kind of um, 
do some research for us, evidence-based research, so that we can add that to our approach and how we interact with our community. And I'll pass it back to Sean now. Great. Um, so obviously it's a great team. We, uh, we have a couple more people downstairs too, and we, um, <clears throat> we have a great team who work on all these great projects. Some of our challenges we face, um, staffing, we're the same size department we, we were 15 years ago, so we uh, constantly trying to do more with, more with the same, I guess. Uh, um, obviously, providing 24-7 support to everything, it, it doesn't give us many opportunities to um, upgrade things without planning things out really well. We can't just go over to the police department and shut things down for the weekend to upgrade things for them. Um, and then the last thing that we um, we're working on more on this year is providing training to end users. The the pace of change of the systems we have is is increasing, and just trying to make sure that our users keep up with keep up with that change so that they can they can best use the systems that we invest in. So uh, with that, I don't know if you have any questions. Keeping in mind we have five more departments to go through, are there any other, any questions? I know we have tons, but yes, Evan. I have a lot of questions, but I'll keep it to just uh, one question. Um, on, on one of the slides, there was uh, mention of downtown Wi-Fi upgrades. If I could yeah. just get a quick overview yeah. of what that plan is. Yeah, so the plan is, um, with the nicer weather we have, we actually have two units that are gonna go out on the test units out in the back where the um, Banks parking garage is, and then basically the plan is to um, do everything early spring, replace what's out there early spring. We have the capital money to do it. Anything else? Thank you. Thanks, we kept Next it to, group uh, up. Six, we kept it to and thank 16 you. minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for all of the work you've done to help counselors get onto their computers and so forth. Thank you. We must be doing economic development next. <laughs> Good morning, Jeff Kravitz, Economic Development Director. Um, real quick, I'll give you an overview of what I'm gonna be talking about today, uh, the department in general, some of the highlights, some of the other responsibilities of the department. Then I'm gonna present some uh, employment and wage data, such as the unemployment rate, the number of jobs in Amherst, um, wages for different sectors and industries, and uh, an overview of the local option meals and rooms tax revenues, uh, and then briefly discuss our challenges. So, about the department. Um, department is three years old. Um, we have one employee, me, so 100% of the department is here. And our non-salary budget is $0. And we'll get back to this when we talk about challenges. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. The mission is up on the economic development web page. But I think it's important to highlight that, you know, a lot of these things talk about Amherst community values or consistent with the character of Amherst. And I think it's important to, to talk about that and, and say that it's not that we're looking for any opportunity, any sort of business that wants to come in here. It has to be something that, that supports what what Amherst is and what Amherst wants to become. Um, and I won't give examples of types of businesses <laughs> that we didn't think would be a good fit, but there, there have been things that we thought were not um, quite aligned with, with what Amherst is. Um, so, oh, sorry, and innovation and entrepreneurship. So just talking about some of the things um, that I do on a, a regular basis. The Amherst Center Cultural District Steering Committee, um, the Cultural District was formed in 2016. We've had uh, received two uh, grants of $5,000. One was a matching grant, one was not. Um, and a quick plug, April 26th through May 4th is Art Week, and there are gonna be events throughout Amherst, so please try and attend. 
Uh, the Western Mass Economic Development Partners is a monthly meeting of economic development professionals, uh, Chamber of Commerce folks throughout Western Mass, held in Springfield at the Western Mass EDC. They also put on uh, every other year a developers conference that we attend, or that I attend, um, and presented, had a table at. Uh, and uh, there's also annual presentations that I give to that group about the Amherst economy, developments, jobs, that sort of thing. Uh, the Massachusetts Municipal Association is another monthly meeting. The policy group meets in Boston. Um, and I provide feedback on economic development bills, bring back other types of things. There was a presentation on aging in place and various uh, things that impact municipalities. and then. Through that, I was asked to speak on marijuana, which we'll get to in other responsibilities, but at, at the MMA annual meeting, which a number of you were at, as well as there's a, an event at the Social Library with the mayors from Holyoke and Northampton, and um, I presented there uh, in conjunction with the MMA, the Cannabis Control Commission, and the Social Law Library. Uh, the International Town Gallon Association, Amherst and UMass are members of. They have an annual meeting. Um, that Amherst has presented at in the past. Uh, a great resource to see what other college towns and universities are doing throughout the country and uh, highly recommend it. You will, every time I go, I come back saying, oh, we're not the only ones facing this. Everybody, all these communities are facing very similar issues. Um, then moving on to economic development, I was the uh, staff coordinator for applying to be a community compact cabinet member for Amherst. Um, it does a number of things, but specifically gives us extra points on grant applications, uh, not just economic development grant, but MassWorks grants, um, all sorts of different state grants. But as a result of that, we received $25,000 to do um, three reports that are also on the economic development webpage, an economic indicators report, a retail market analysis for Amherst, um, and a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis. Um, then the North Amherst Opportunity Zone. This is new. Um, North Amherst, well, we actually applied for, for two areas in Amherst. Essentially, it's a way for people to reinvest capital gains in certain census tracts um, that meet certain criteria. And North Amherst was one of that. I worked with uh, Nate Malloy in the planning department on, on applying for that designation. Um, and the idea is to, to spur investment in certain areas. Um, then retention of businesses. I'll give one quick example, FTL Labs, which um, does scientific research and development um, outgrew their space. They were an Amherst company, and I was able to connect them with a property owner who had available space that, so that they could stay in Amherst and continue to grow here. Um, for agriculture and farming, I've uh, been to several of the Agricultural Commission meetings, talked to them about um, things that we can do to help promote farm stands, um, worked with the farmer's market, on some of their issues, and then also help disseminate information during the drought about um, potential disaster loans and grants that uh, agricultural um, institutions could apply for. Um, and then the Amherst Half Marathon, which is new. It's only been around for two years, but main point of contact for that, coordinating with police and fire for emergency services, road closures, uh, that type of thing, and then um, following up with this group to, and this formerly the select board with the results of the marathon. It brings in about 600 people each year. And again, it's new and it's growing. Last year it was during homecoming weekend. Um, so it was a little bit of an odd weekend, but um, I think that they, they love coming here and are excited. Um, and so I think it's, goes along with my point from the previous slide. That's something that I think is really consistent with Amherst. It's you know a healthy lifestyle. It's an active lifestyle. Um, so supporting those types of things and then working with the surrounding businesses to say, hey, do you want to offer a 
bib brunch where you come in with your racers bib and you get a special price on a brunch and trying to create economic activity out of those types of events. Innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, since I got here, the first co-working space in Amherst opened. Amherst works. Um, by all accounts, it's, it's doing very well. It's got a number of um, offices, including the UMass Data Science Center. Executive director has office hours there, um, so making connections with UMass and bring some of them downtown. Uh, and it's the, the first space in Amherst that sort of creates a an urban co-working feel that's been really successful in Boston and Cambridge and Austin and throughout the, uh, San Francisco. Um, and then finally, the relationships with UMass, um, specifically the Institute of Applied Life Sciences and Data Science Center, um, regular meetings with the Data Science Executive Director, quarterly meetings with the Executive Director um, of IELTS, just talking about what interesting things are students and faculty doing that might be um, commercializ commercializable, um, might be spin offable uh, mm -hmm. into Amherst, and trying to connect them again with property owners who have space to rent so that we can try and keep some of these companies in Amherst. Um, oh, and for applied life science is one of the connections I made. Um, and this goes to an earlier point in the slide with the Western Mass Economic Development Partners, invited them to come speak to them. They, uh, Life Sciences said, hey, what's, who, how do we talk to these people? How do we reach out to them? And I said, oh, I meet with them monthly. Come present. And they did a presentation and made some good connections. Um, they were promoting a voucher program for manufacturers in Western Mass. All right. The second half is quick. So other responsibilities. This will be very quick, too, because I don't have time to go into details. But if you want to invite me back, I'm happy to talk about any of these things in more detail. Um, one of them is marijuana, worked on the zoning for recreational marijuana establishments, the general bylaws, um, process for evaluating potential operators, negotiation of host community agreements, parking. Previously, I've worked um, with the downtown parking working group and Department of Public Works and police on a updated winter parking policy, which went into effect two years ago. Uh, UMass Data Science for Good Parking Project. I'll touch on that quickly. How did they, they set up a webcam and figured out if they could create uh, artificial intelligence to determine if there was a car parked in a spot. Um, and it was sort of a pilot program. It ran for, I think, about a month. And I think their, their AI program got about 80 to 85 percent accurate, which was pretty interesting. So trying to find town-gown relationships to solve municipal problems uh, at the university level. And um, now the staff liaison to the downtown parking working group. Bylaw review support um, the bylaw review committee, who are eager to continue their work uh, and, and finish up um, with the bylaw reviews. And then town-gown relations, um, things like public-private partnership, economic opportunities like I talked about, and the uh, upcoming strategic partnership agreement renewal. So employment and wage data. And there may be a lot of questions here, and I'm happy to flip back if there are, but I just want to go through them. They're all in your packet. And again, happy to come back and go into more detail. Um, Unemployment rate in Amherst has been steadily in decline since 2010. In fact, the last two months, it's been under 2%, which is pretty incredible. And just for comparison, Hampshire County similarly tracks Amherst. And the state don't have 2018 final data yet, but again, similar downward trend. These are the number of jobs in Amherst for the last two years. Um, you can see that it's grown fairly steadily added 1,300 jobs uh, since the beginning of 2017. Average weekly wages have increased by $150 a week, which turns out to $7,800 a year. That's an 18% increase since 2010. And this is just sort of a weekly wage comparison for other similar communities. Um, there, we can pull in other communities if you want to see different comparisons. I thought these were somewhat comparable. So I think we're doing fairly well for the surrounding community and, and statewide. Here's the breakdown by industry. 
This is the minimum wage. This is the living wage in Western Mass, as most recently calculated. And that is the average wage in Amherst. Um, I think it's obviously pulled up because you'll see right next to it, I think, is educational services. And we have such a large number of people employed in that industry. Um, but still, you can see that all but three industries make above the living wage in the area, which, which is fairly good. So now I'm going to talk about some specific sectors of, of the economy. Um, retail, wages have gone up since 2012, 14% increase. And since the low point in 2014, we've seen 86 additional jobs in the retail sector. Um, this is information technology. See, generally wages have gone up, except for I don't know what happened in 2016, heading back down a little bit. Um, but it's just interesting to see how, how the number of jobs have changed. Um, nearly returned to our peak in 2013. Educational services, again, the largest sector of the economy. It's had steady growth, which is a good thing. Um, wages have gone up 18% since 2010, and it's added about 1,600 jobs in that time. Arts, entertainment, and recreation. Uh, I'm definitely going to spend some more time looking at this, because I don't know why it fluctuates quite so broadly, um, but wages have been fairly steady since 2010, down 13% since the peak in 2013, um, but we've averaged about 11 new jobs a year, um, so totally uh, seven, 77 more jobs than we had in 2010. And then local option meals and rooms tax revenue, this is a decent proxy for tourism. Um, People stay in hotels, people uh, spend money when they're on vacation. Um, so I wanted to include that. And then last slide is gonna be current challenges. I think the first one is the coordinated execution of the master plan. I think that what I've heard from the community is they don't, people trying to do business, trying to do, they don't understand why they go to one board or committee and hear one thing and then go to a different board and hear a different thing. And um, I think that I understand each board has their own responsibilities and what they focus on, but understanding here's the overall picture. This is a business we want. This is a project we want. And making sure that that is felt throughout the process of interacting with the town, I think, would be um, valuable. Or it's something that we don't want. And then I don't tell them, yeah, this is a great idea. We're, all, we're behind you. Um, and then the second is limited resources and multiple responsibilities. Um, right now, the, the town invests in me um, for economic development, and any time spent not doing economic development uh, means that it's not <coughs> happening. So um, there's also a benefit to investing in economic development, more economic activity, which means a stabler tax base, and more revenue to support municipal services. So, Thank you very much. That's my presentation. Happy to take questions if I have some. I, I just want to emphasize, you mentioned there were three reports on the website yes. that you received a grant to do. Yes. And one of them was around the whole employment statistics? Uh, no, this is, uh, so I should have explained that. A lot of this data is pulled from state websites, uh, Department you. of Revenue, local services, and labor and workforce development. Okay. Uh, the other thing I just also want to mention is we are trying to schedule a session, if you will, with the chamber, and Jeff will be part of that to talk about economic development. Right now, we're all the way into April to look at for possible dates. And questions? Yes. Start here. Andy Jo? The meals slide and the... I, I guess it's meals and rooms tax. That rooms tax has a precipitous decline. Did something change between 2014 and 2015 to cause that? Yes, it did. <laughs> Could you tell us and explain what that was? Yes, there was a court ruling that the UMass Hotel did not need to um, pay the rooms tax. So my understanding is that what currently happens is UMass does pay the rooms tax um, for any 
room rental that is not done through a university account. So we are getting some funds from the rooms tax, but there, there was a precipitous drop in 2014 because of that. Interesting. Yes, Kathy? I, I had two questions, but I don't need long answers to them. Um, you have the economic opportunity zone listed up, and that's up where we are in District 1. Um, are there any current plans? I know what that is, but are there current any plans or current interest in using that, basically, a tax loophole that the tax bill opened up? investors. So is there anything in the works was question number one. And then I was just curious on the employment and wage data. Is that out of census data? Because some of it may, when you look at it, may be random variation. It's not, it's, it's sampling kinds of variations. I was just under, wondering what the source is. Yep. So to answer your second question, the source is Department of Labor and Workforce Development data, uh, state data. Um, and to answer your first question, there's a lot of interest and inquiries, but um, I'm not aware of any specific projects that have been proposed. Sarah. So my, oops, so mine is a little bit of a follow-up on that. So I know that one of the things that for our master plan that we're trying to do is really concentrate on village centers and making them better and bringing in more traffic. And I know, so North Am oh, I didn't mean traffic like that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, like to make them, to improve them. I'm just wondering if, um, if other village centers also are, have a, a similar program to bring in investors or if North Amherst is, is different at this time, different. Uh, so the opportunity zones, uh, the eligible ones were based on census track demographics and we applied for, I think Amherst has three and we applied for downtown, the downtown track and the North Amherst track because we thought that's where the most opportunities were um, and the state said you could only have one and so it was in North Amherst. So the short answer is no, the other village centers don't have opportunity zones attached to it but um, I think that I know that we are looking at all of the village centers and how they're different and what types of opportunities would be available in each of them. Okay. Yes, Dorothy. Um, in reference to um, agricultural economic development, um, have you been considering um, a commercial kitchen like Franklin County has and it's completely full up? or even a, a large freezer which can be used by various farms? Yes, um, absolutely. We're, that's one of the ideas. We've talked to uh, an agricultural um, business about they, they wanted to do a little bit more and I've been working with inspection services and planning on how we can allow farms to do more things um, such as hosting weddings, uh, having a commercial kitchen that's available not just to that um, farm, but to other farms. Uh, so we've been trying to explore additional opportunities for agricultural um, institutions and, and how they might diversify what they do. Shalini. Um, so I, um, in talking with many businesses during the campaign trail, I heard from a lot of them there were many hurdles that Amherst had in starting up businesses. So from your perspective, what might be some hurdles that you think we should be focusing on solving? Like, one, for example, one I heard was high permit costs, permitting costs. And two, what are some opportunities that we could be really focusing on as a town? You know, thanks. Sure. So. Uh I'll tell you that that's the first time I've heard high permitting costs as one of the issues. I think each community has their own unique strengths and weaknesses, and I think one of the strengths and weaknesses of Amherst is we have a fairly steady economy um, based, because it's based on education, and we have, um, you know, UMass is backed by the state, uh, and Amherst College has an incredible endowment, and um, so I think that our economy has been fairly steady and you look in other communities that got really hit hard during the um, recession in, in 20, 2009 and 10 
And what you find is they're desperate for businesses, and so they're willing to make things ridiculously easy or ridiculously low cost, and I think that Amherst has kept its high standards um, because we're able to. So, you know, I think that, that there are certainly things that we've been working on to try and make things easier, and, and you heard from um, IT a minute ago about uh, new permitting software, and we're hopeful that that online permitting software is gonna make things much easier for, for people to get through. Um, We've been looking at, at zoning issues, and um, you know I think that there are a, a number of challenges for businesses, but none of them are things that we wouldn't be able to overcome. Given the um, discussion that ha happened at our retreat around the strong interest in economic development and perhaps the formation of uh, some body to address that with the town, I'm sure we'll be talking to you again. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Good morning. Thank you for having us. Um, I am not the best driver of, uh, of slides. So we'll see how I do here. Um, I'm Julie Fetterman. I'm the health director. And with me is Jennifer Brown, our halftime public health nurse. Um, so one of the things I wanted to say to you is that uh, we both love public health. Public health is just awesome. Clearly, CDC thinks so also. Another thing is I wanted to give a shout out as I'm listening to people give their presentations. One of the wonderful things about our department is that we get to work with all the other departments and just how great it is to work with all of our colleagues. Um, so this is our organizational structure. This is where we sit in the town. The health department has had various um, sort of structures. At this point, we are a two-person department, myself and our public health nurse. Um, about three years ago, we moved our health inspectors over into inspection services. And part of that was to um, increase the uh, efficiency in terms of permitting and inspections. That's worked out really well. Um, you see we've got that bubble kind of overlapping with our department because I still work with inspectors on complex issues. On day-to-day -day routine supervision, they come under the building commissioner. Um, we have a board of health that has five members. All 351 towns in Massachusetts have a board of health. Um, that board's power comes directly from the legislature. Our board has a physician, a nurse, two environmental scientists, and at this point we have someone whose um, background is neurology, which has been actually fantastic as we've been looking at marijuana. The mission of both the board and the public health are to promote the health and well-being of the community. The reason I chose this slide is because while we do that from our office, we're also out in the community. We're out in homes, we're out in the street, we're talking to people. Um, assessment is the basis for what we do. So we look at data frequently that comes from the state, that comes from some of our regional entities. For instance, Cooley Dickinson as our community hospital has to do a community assessment every three years. Um, we're really lucky in Massachusetts to have phenomenal data. We're also assessing our community through a lot of our human service partners. Policy development, while that sounds very dry, um, the reason I chose this slide is because we have internal department policy, we have interdepartment policy, which is the concept of health in all policies, and that's where I'm, as health director, working with the planning department, inspection services, zoning, to look at where the public health um, impacts are as we create projects and as we create policies for everything we do in town. Um, we also, on the Board of Health, are creating reg regulations and policy. And again, the reason I chose this slide is because when the board is looking at something, for example, several years ago, 
uh, they were creating styrofoam regulations. They were not only looking at the environmental impact, but also at the impact on businesses. And so as we create policy, we're really trying to look at all the implications we can within the community for people, for businesses, for the environment. Um, we provide some services and educational opportunities. This um, is an example of what we were doing during the drought. So the uh, posters you see up there about washing full loads and taking shorter showers was part of a collaboration with the university. Uh, we have great um, relationships with the university that allow us to be able to do so much more. We put these up around town um, because one of the impacts on the drought was is that if we really used up too much of our water, it could mean that our water supplies um, quality would uh, decrease. Assurance. This is ensuring that all Amherst residents have the services necessary to maintain good health. So this is our building commissioner, Rob Mora. He is putting up a sign pointing to the Musanti Health Center. The uh, John P. Musanti Health Center um, was a huge undertaking regionally and was something that I watched for about 23 years as we looked at what people in Amherst and surrounding communities needed. And um, it really has been a privilege to see this actually come to fruition. And again, this was an opportunity to work with many departments um, and with many of our partners in Hampshire County. The Board of Health is responsible for the protection and promotion of public health, the control of disease, and the promotion of sanitary living conditions. They create new re regulations, review existing regulations to bring them up to um, current times, and they also um, will review variance requests from a restaurant, from a building owner, so that while these regulations are very um, strict and enforceable, the board is also approachable around changing things um, that perhaps in a particular situation are not equitable. <clears throat> the agents of the Board and in Health include myself and the inspectors who are located in the Inspection Services Department. They are responsible for enforcement of Board of Health and state regulations, housing, food establishments, camps, body arts, body arts is tattooing and piercing for those of you not in the know, uh, pools, wood burning devices, wells, Title V. I chose this picture because um, we're all familiar with the romaine lettuce outbreaks. And again, when we're looking at public health, um, there are many pieces that come into play in terms of keeping the public healthy. And for those who've never experienced being ill from a communicable disease or a food or waterborne illness, sometimes it seems like our regulations and our inspections are, um, are very strict, but it's all about preventing things from happening. Public health is invisible when it works. Currently, the Board of Health is looking at our tobacco regulations to update them. Um, one of the things we're seeing is an epidemic of vaping across the country. Uh, vaping is, this little device on the left is an example of a vaporizer. It's a very small thing. We're finding that children, youth across the country, in Massachusetts, in Amherst, are able to vape in the classroom, in the bathroom, whether it's tobacco and sometimes marijuana, they're able to do this in essentially an odorless way. So right now, this semester, we have a team of nursing students and one of our board members who is going to be creating education for the schools and working closely with the school departments, because, the school department, because they are very concerned about what they're seeing in the schools. Um, the Board of Health uh, and myself are also monitoring the rollout of adult use marijuana to see if we need local regulations. 
Infectious disease control is a large portion of what we do. We monitor cases of 60 different reportable communicable diseases, including tuberculosis. This involves case investigation to contain and control the spread of diseases that you may be familiar with, such as pertussis, which is whooping cough, and foodborne illness. So we get a lot of electronic notification from the state. Back in the day when I first started doing this, we got a letter in the mail. It was a lab result. So by the time we got it, quite some time had gone by. Now, um, at any time, 24 hours a day, Jennifer or myself can check our electronic disease system and find out if someone is ill. Um, th Jennifer then makes a phone call to the patient, um, makes sure they're getting all the health care they need, and then also does um, control of contacts. If we see something that appears to be foodborne, she's then working with the health inspectors. We'll go out and do an inspection, figure out if there was a food involved. Um, and at the same time, the state is monitoring all the towns around us. So it can be lots of fun because they'll be able to see, oh, well, you've got one person who ate at such and such, and such a place or bought chicken at such and such a place. But we can see in the towns surrounding you, there are six other people. And so that way, we're partnering with the state and controlling things as soon as possible. Again, it's invisible when it works. We've got great food establishments in town. Some of the programs that we administer are a sharps disposal program. Uh, many years ago, we were one of the first towns to get a small grant so that we could accept um, use needles into our department. Um, this is different than a needle exchange, which is for IV drug users. Though, of course, if an IV drug user wanted to come to us and purchase a sharps disposal um, box, that would be fine too. What we really see is people who have to take medications at home. Um, so this is something that operates out of our department and, is, and also out of the transfer station. We work with DPW on this. Since 1998, we've provided childhood immunizations for those who are either um, underinsured or low income and not able to really use their insurance. Because as we know in Massachusetts, we've worked for a long time. People have health insurance. They can't always use it. We also have people in town f whose um, legal status is not something where they're applying for insurance. So we work very closely with the schools to make sure everyone gets immunized as quickly as possible so they can begin school. Um, we have had health insurance um, navigation in our department for about 15 years. Most recently, this is a partnership with the Musanti Health Center. A navigator comes to our department a day and a half a week, bilingual Spanish, to help people access health insurance or to stay on their health insurance. If you have Medicaid, it's often you're constantly having to reapply and reprove that you're eligible. We also do education through the schools. Examples of things are mosquito and tick-borne illness, and as I mentioned before, vaping currently. We work closely with many regional entities. Um, the Adult Use Marijuana Review Committee was a committee that I was on with Jeff Kravitz, a member of the select board, the police chief, the planning director. We spent a few years looking at the rollout of adult marijuana and then in this most frequent uh, previous six months actually meeting with entities uh, who wanted to open retail establishments. I chair the Amherst Human Service Network uh, with um, a human service agency partner. Every month we meet to talk about what's happening in the community, what our human service agencies are seeing, what they're facing. It's a great opportunity when something emerges in the community for us to work together to think how to address issues. I convene a homeless systems meeting. Stakeholders are around the table. We've been doing this for over two years now. Um, again, we have um, deep um, 
difficult conversations about how we serve those in our community experiencing homelessness, how we interface with the regional agencies who work to prevent homelessness, and working, and we also discuss, um, we, we have a, a private conversation about even specific individuals that we know of experiencing homelessness because we have providers right at the table and we try to troubleshoot solutions to help individuals as well as creating a structure to serve people. Hampshire Hope is a, is a Hampshire County wide entity that is working to prevent and improve services for people experience, experiencing substance use disorder. Um, Amherst and five other communities applied for grant funding to begin this coalition as we saw this, the um, impact of the opioid epidemic in Massachusetts. The Pioneer Valley Tobacco Coalition is 27 communities in Hamden, Hampshire, and Franklin County that Amherst is part of. That's how we enforce our tobacco regulations and also how we stay current with what the state's model regulations and suggestions are. Um, we have an ongoing relationship with the Musanti Health Center as they continue to grow. They've just recently added, as I mentioned before, a health insurance navigator, and they are also just adding full-time behavioral health that will be bilingual in Spanish. That was, again, a big need that we were bringing forward as the health center was being developed. This is my last slide, I believe. Emergency planning is something that's been going on um, in Amherst at least since the end of the 90s. Um, I love this slide because um, it points out that it's the planning, not the plan. So we work with um, town departments very closely with the University of Massachusetts. The Hampshire Public Health Preparedness Coalition is a coalition that was funded after 9-11 through Homeland Security funds that went out to the states. I'm on the executive board of that committee. Um, and the the uh, Western Mass Health and Medical Coordinating Coalition was something that was created a couple of years ago so that we were improving our preparedness in Massachusetts because we were siloing a little bit. So this was to bring in emergency medical services and hospitals more to this planning. Um, but the reason the kitty cat has a sandwich is because we plan and we plan and we plan and then something happens and we have to get very creative. And we have to think what are we actually gonna do in this situation? And so all those years of meeting together and planning together, we know everyone's strengths. We know who's got the cats, who's got the bread, and who's going to tie it all together and get it to people. Um, I think that really shows a lot of our strength in the town. Um, and also in Hampshire County, we've done a really good job around this. So I apologize for my rusty voice. I'm uh, fighting a cold, and hopefully I've left enough time for some questions. Are there questions? Dorothy. Um, it's two, two parts. Um, in Amherst, can anyone get an exemption from a vaccine in the school system? Um, so how that works is it's Massachusetts law. So you are able to ask for um, a religious exemption. Um, in reality, in Amherst, what we found is that um, many years ago when we started this collaboration around vaccines is it was not that we had so many people who wanted exemptions, it's that it was so many people who just didn't have access to health care. So we do not have that many people um, in Amherst or in Hampshire County who get exemptions. There is more of that in Franklin County. And the second part is, I'm just remembering um, in the past when, say, for example, the Astoria Health Center, anyone could go in there. You didn't have to prove you were poor or that you needed money. Um, and you could just bring your baby, get well baby care and the free vaccinations. Mm -hmm. Is there anything like that where you can just walk in and get free vaccinations? Yes, you can come to the health department. You can't just walk in only because... It's Jennifer and I. So, and actually, to give a vaccination, you have a responsibility to know a little bit about who you're vaccinating and what they need. 
But what we do is we make an appointment with that person, um, and then, yes, we vaccinate them. We also really try to connect them to a medical home because vaccines have two purposes. One is, of course, to so that immunity is created. There's also that we don't want any block to someone getting childcare or getting into schools, so they need to be vaccinated appropriately. But really, ultimately, everyone needs a medical home that they feel safe to go to, that they feel well served, and that they feel like they can afford. And with the opening of the Musanti Health Center, we really feel like everyone can have a medical home now. Thank you. George. My understanding is that uh, communities in Massachusetts are differently affected by the opioid uh, crisis. And I'm wondering what your sense of it is in Amherst and whether you are getting data that you need uh, to sort of keep it, get a sense of what it's, what mm -hmm. it's like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in Amherst, unfortunately across the state, the way the opioid epidemic has been um, tracked is by overdoses and overdose deaths. Um, and so we are not seeing a lot of overdoses or a lot of overdose deaths in Amherst. Um, but for the past 18 months, I've met regularly and kept in close contact with fire and police so that we're looking at every use of Narcan in an ambulance, every call to a home. Um, our police department is uh, doing what um, many departments in Massachusetts and especially in Hampshire County are doing, which is door knocks after there is use of Narcan. Um, our community policing officers, when they're getting to know people on the street who they think are using IV drugs, are forming relationships with them. Um, so I feel that Amherst is affected by opioid and drug use, but that we don't have necessarily a lot of data about that um, because it can often be very hidden. So the bottom line is we're not seeing a lot of overdoses and we're certainly not seeing a lot of overdo overdose deaths. But that doesn't mean that we're not having all the conversations that we need to have and working closely with healthcare professionals and with the schools around um, how we keep our eye on this and how we're educating, especially our youth. Do you do the inspections for farmers markets? So all the inspectors, um, I'm an agent of the Board of Health, but really what I do is very rarely am I doing inspections. We have two and a half inspectors in inspection services. So we have Susan Malone, who's a full-time health inspector. Ed Smith is a full-time health inspector. And John Thompson is our code enforcement officer who can enforce health and building code. Mm -hmm. So the inspection of the farmer's markets happens out of inspection services, and Susan Malone is usually the one doing that. And they are inspecting even vendors who come from out of town. Oh, yes. Everything that happens in Amherst around food, um, for instance, if you have a caterer who's coming from out of town and they're getting a temporary food permit, all of that is overseen by um, the health inspectors. The reason I'm asking is I understand that we've had three vendors that have been told they either can't provide something they're presently were providing or cannot in the future provide at all. I don't know the details of specifically what you're talking about. One thing that just happened was in October of 2018, um, Massachusetts adopted a new merged food code, so there's a national food code, um, and then there's the Massachusetts code, um, and so it takes time, but they finally passed that in October. Um, I'll be going to a training about the new merged food code in two weeks. I've been talking with Susan about some of the changes in there. Some of the changes have been great because they've actually loosened up a few things mm -hmm. that um, were looked at to be not necessary um, to the public's health to control in such a way. Other things have tightened up a little bit. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, Shalini. I was curious if um, you've looked into mindfulness as a, a, a possible solution. From what I understand, it's a low-cost solution to many chronic problems, addictions, um, especially in school children. 
Well, I'm personally very interested in that. I, I believe in that myself. I know that in some of our schools, um, they are using some mindfulness. So I believe it is in Wildwood where there's some mindfulness going on. Um, I don't know um, that that has been being explored in many ways um, in the schools, but I absolutely agree with you, and I'm, I'm glad you're bringing that up. George. We recently had a, a very tragic event in uh, our shelter, and um, I'm wondering when that sort of thing happens, does that involve your department? Um, do you get involved, and um, what do you learn from these sorts of events? Thank you. So there was a death at the shelter. Um, and yeah, the answer to that is yes. We work closely with the staff at the shelter. Um, so for example, um, we reached out to them about what they, the staff there might need for their own process. Um, and we also are very closely linked with them whenever there's something happening around health that might affect our folks who are homeless. So for example, yesterday, um, a, an advisory came out from the state about a slight uptick in um, HIV, fresh I, new HIV transmissions among IV drug users. So I am immediately contacting the director of the shelter so that she knows about that. We're communicating. Of course, we're always wanting to teach people about the importance of using clean syringes if they are using, about harm reduction, about um, safe and protected sex. Um, so we're in really close relationship. Um, in the fall, there was um, a reported outbreak in eastern Massachusetts of hepatitis A among the homeless. And so, again, Jennifer and myself were working closely to provide vaccinations one-on-one -on -one to folks experiencing homelessness or anyone who uses IV drugs because they're also at risk. So, yeah, we're working really closely with all of our partners who serve the homeless. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think we uh, unfortunately are forced to move on, but thank you for your service to the town. Now we're going to find out about Margaret's other job. I'm here to talk to you about my other job, <laughs> our department, town clerk's office. So thank you. I really appreciate you allowing me to come and talk with you about what the town clerk's office does. I'm sure you all have different things that, that come into mind or come to mind when uh, you think about the town clerk's office, whether it's elections, dog licensing, and right now with the issuance of the street listing forms, the annual, the annual census. So we uh, in the town clerk's office are a staff of three, including uh, myself. Um, and I should probably just give you a 30 second, let me give you a 30 second bio uh, of myself. Um, I uh, started my public service career in Amherst uh, years ago and worked for the town of Amherst. I started working for the town of Amherst under the magnificent uh, Stan Zomek. Um, that was my first stop in Amherst, and then I moved along uh, and ended up in the town clerk's office and served as town clerk for the last five years of my tenure here. And I was extremely fortunate after leaving here and taking a small uh, break to work part-time and spend more time with family, I moved on to municipal management um, in, a, in a couple of small towns. So I spent 13 years combined um, managing um, the towns of Sunderland uh, and Rutland, which is just outside of Worcester. And I just celebrated my six month anniversary back in Amherst um, last week. So I've been here for six months. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we are a staff of, of three. Um, the town clerk's office is one of those municipal departments that's extremely heavily governed by, by statute. 
Uh, so the town clerk's office uh, has to comply with 73 chapters and 451 sections of mass general laws and many, many, many regulations that are issued by agencies um, that, that, are in, that, are, that control those, those statutes. The town clerk um, is separated into three, essentially three different divisions. We have the town clerk's office, and here is an outline of some of the things the town clerk's office does. And then the other two divisions are elections and registration, so we're just going to take them uh, one by one. The town clerk's office, as it says on the slide, is the general store of municipal government, and also the archive center, I should add. Um, we have um, the examples of things the town clerk's office does on this slide. Each are governed by separate and distinct statutes of mass general law, except for passport acceptance, which is governed by federal regulation and laws. Um, vital records in particular, I'm only going to highlight one of these things, you can certainly uh, read the, the numbers, but vital records in particular has seen um, a, a creep up in issuance because of the new um, federal regulation for real IDs. So we are seeing uh, an ever increasing um, volume of requests for vital records so people can get uh, their new I IDs. Uh, the statutes are frequently uh, changing and since I was last in Amherst, um, I think all of the laws pertaining to all of these items have changed several, several times. Now, records management. Uh, the town clerk's office is the archive center for the town. Um, we maintain current and historical uh, records of the town going back to the town's 1759 incorporation and before. We actually have militia records, um, and you're welcome to make an appointment with us. We'll take you on a tour of our vault at some point. Um, but yes, the town is actually celebrating its 260th anniversary of its incorporation next week, February 13th. So we do keep records management. Um, we do keep records uh, going back in time. And again, because of the statutes we're governed by, we kind of have to do it, uh, our, our archives, in a somewhat archaic way. We still have to maintain paper, and we have lots of, of paper. However, um, with the IT presentation you saw earlier, IT is looking at um, implementing a new permitting software and a document management solution that I hope our office is the, the beneficiary of. Okay, election, now we're moving on to elections and registration. Uh, chapters 51 through 54 of the Mass General Laws uh, govern most of what, uh, of what we know as our elections and registration uh, process. As the town clerk, I am the chief elections official and a member of the Board of Registrars in Amherst. We have a four member Board of Registrars. I'm one of the members. Uh, currently, we have one vacancy on the board. The other members are Bob Pam and Jamie Wagner. Um, so they, uh, on the next slide, I'll get into uh, the work of the, of the Board of Registrars. But to prepare for an election, this is not a two-week process. Uh, this is a many months process. In fact, elections and registration happens year-round. Uh, to prepare solely for an election, we have to recruit, train, and schedule up to 300 election workers to staff our uh, 10 polling places throughout towns. We have 10 polling places in uh, eight different uh, buildings. Um, we prepare and post all election warrants. We prepare all of our absentee, official, and early voting ballots, and yes, each is a separate separately um, printed ballot specially identified for the type of voting the person is going to do. Uh, we have to maintain our voting equipment year round. We have to test the voting equipment in accordance with uh, Massachusetts regulations. We conduct absentee voting and early voting for state elections. And I should note that the Secretary of the Commonwealth is now looking at the possibility of early voting 
for the presidential primary in 2020. So this will be something new. It's going to take us in a, in a new direction, uh, potentially with state primaries and presidential primaries, and that could evolve into local elections. Uh, then again, as I said, we operate 10 polling places in eight different buildings, and we are required, I am required to tally and certify the election results. Now, this next slide talks about registration, and this ties in with the annual census process. I would like to say that it starts with the annual process, but this is, this uh, annual census cycle represents an annual cycle. Everything is, is tied uh, to each other. Um, so as far as, uh, as registration and maintaining the voter list, we do uh, use the local street listing form to update our lists of registered voters. If a census form comes back and a registered voter has moved, that voter is put on what we call the inactive voters list, and that person, if they don't take any other action to, to vote, um, or to maintain active on the voter registration list, um, they uh, would be removed from the voter list with due notice after four years, after two consecutive general elections. After we issue the, the local street listing form and process it, we mail uh, confirmation cards to every single registered uh, voter in town in the spring. That's required by law and by state regulation. This is to ask again if we have not received a census form from the voter, we ask again, are you here? And we hope to receive answers to those. Um, we prepare a street listing and a jury list from the information that we gain um, in, the, in the census process. The jury list is not an elective uh, function of the town clerk's office. It is another statutory requirement. So we do have to provide that. And then, again, that all ties into the, uh, the voter list uh, maintenance and upkeep. Uh, the next, um, did I just skip? There we go. Everything in our voter list is tied to what we call the Voter Registration Information System. It's a statewide database of registered voters throughout the Commonwealth, and it tracks not only where a voter is currently registered, but that voter's activity in their current community, in their prior communities. So it tracks the motions of every registered voter. So we are, I think this, this Commonwealth does a very good job of, of mitigating voter fraud through this system, but it also protects the voter in that if the voter says, well, I'm registered to vote, we have the ability to look that voter up find out where they're registered to vote, what the voter status is, and direct them to the proper polling place to be able to vote. Um, this voter registration system, just like our voter list, just like our resident list, is maintained throughout the year. We do see peaks with, um, with voter activity, with uh, uh, nomination papers and petitions which have to be processed and entered into the system, um, with actual voting where all activity is entered into the system and other things that keep a voter's uh, status up to date. Now the last slide I have, I still, I think I'm still within my time. <laughs> I'm trying to fly through this, I'm sorry. Uh, upcoming projects, we have a list of upcoming projects here mostly geared toward uh, the upcoming uh, elections. But I wanted to add that um, in coming back here and, and having kind of the breadth of experience that I've, that's, that's my time. <laughs> Oops, okay. So I, I'll add one last thing. My, my hope is that we can establish a town ga uh, gown coalition um, representing stakeholders from the town, from the institutions of higher education, and other, um, and other uh, segments of the community to promote voter participation through education and outreach. So I have actually started uh, pulling together working groups. We have one scheduled actually um, this week. Um, but that's going to require a firm commitment by all stakeholders to work with each other um, in, in a collaborative uh, way in order to effectively get out voter information. So that concludes my presentation for now. If anybody has any questions. Can I just, this goes back to a, a prior life. Um, 
you work on the census, so you do the block listing, and then that goes into the block estimates that then lead to redistricting. That's a that's a great um, a great comment because the annual street listing least listing we do is not tied to okay. the decennial federal census. Okay. However, I am the census the town clerk is a census liaison and will work with districting and reprecincting. And to make sure that listings are correct that's, that are then used. That's right. So for the resident okay. listings um, that are generated by the census, the federal census right. count, yes. Yeah. Did, just for the another connection to our own University of Massachusetts, which works with the Secretary of State on the decennial census, actually mm. every year works on the census, and provides the block estimates that then go to the State House, where they do the redistrict, they draw the district lines. So, right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Else? Thank you. Thank you. So just to. Note this, she didn't point out her additional job here, which is being our town clerk. Um, next. And I very much appreciate being appointed as your er, clerk of the council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, almost afternoon, goodness. <laughs> I'm Barb Bills and I'm the director of Amherst Leisure Services and I'm really happy to be here today and uh, thank you all for being here. And I'd like to inter or have my staff that are with me today introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Stacy LaCleve and I'm a program director in charge of children's programs that are not sports related, so summer day camps, after school. Hi, I'm Chris Johnson, I'm the sports director uh, in charge of all programming, camps, and events. Our mission at LSSC is to enrich the quality of life for all members of our community by providing the highest level of recreational programs and facilities and services. We do this through a wide variety of, uh, by offering a wide variety of programs that take advantage of all the rich resources that Amherst has to offer. We are dedicated, we have a dedicated staff, commissions, commission members, and community volunteers. While we serve both children and adults, our major program focus is youth activities, and we strive to serve all those members of our community. Last year, 1,164 children received fee subsidies so that they could participate in our programs. Last year, we also established a new program outreach initiative to better serve children living in our town's low to moderate income housing areas. We are now providing on-site services and programs in, at South Point, North Village, Butternut Farms, Mill Valley, Olympia Oaks, and Village Park. Great. So whether it's winning the cardboard classic sled race at Winterfest, or taking an art class at a local studio downtown, LSSC is about fun, active, and safe experiences. From Ultimate, which was invented in Amherst, to football, basketball, lacrosse, and more, just about every child involved today in high school athletics got their start at LSSE. Our two pools, our two outdoor pools, I should say, the middle school pool and Totman pool at UMass are some of our most valued and utilized resources in town. Last year, 1,686 children took swimming lessons through LSSE and over 12,000 adults and children utilized our pools. As I'm sure you're all aware, we are in the process of renovating Groff Park. This is a major undertaking. We are hopeful that this summer we'll have a brand new playground and spray park at Groff. But our ultimate goal for aquatics and for our program 
is to teach every child in Amherst how to swim. It's a lofty goal, but we believe it's doable. LSSC brings our community together by hosting three major events, the 4th of July, Halloween Fest, and Winterfest. Currently, we're in the midst of Winterfest. It started 11 years ago as a one-day event and now has become an event that takes, it takes place over eight days, has almost 40 different events at 30 different venues throughout the town. I'd like to take this opportunity to invite any of you who are interested to become one of our celebrity judges for the chili cook-off at Winterfest this Saturday. <laughs> so I just want you to know that you were our first choices. So <laughs> if you're interested, just, just email me and I'll put you on the A-list. So from special events to community theater, it takes a village to make all of this happen. We collaborate with a variety of community partners, including the BID, the Chamber, UMass, the Amherst Public Schools, other town departments, social service agencies, local businesses, and more. Their partners are instrumental to the success of our events, and we see ourselves as the conveners. One of, one of the most beautiful pieces of land owned by the town is Cherry Hill. During every season of the year, our residents enjoy this very special open space. Last year alone, 11,344 children and adults played golf there. And hundreds of Nordic skiers enjoyed cross-country skiing on freshly groomed trails when, during the winter months when weather permit, permitted it. Now again, none of this would be possible without an amazing team of staff and volunteers. My, st my staff, as you can see, can dress in up and have fun, but they're really all hardworking professionals. We also have a great commission, and those members are responsible for setting our policy and ensuring that we're meeting our goals. And finally, we couldn't run the majority of our programs without our community volunteers. Last year, we had 143 volunteer coaches and another 672 program volunteers for a combined 17, 000, or close to 17,000 volunteer hours. That's really amazing contribution to this community. And now I'd like to have Stacy and Chris speak a little bit more about their respective program areas. Hello, uh, so my name is Stacy again. And uh, my role is uh, children's programs that are not sports related, um, including our after school at Crocker, which that's a picture um, from um, maybe two years ago. Um, we serve almost 100 children every day after school at Crocker Farm. Um, I am in charge of our summer day camps and school vacation camp weeks, our performing and visual art classes. Those are youth and adult. Um, we're currently serving about 1,000 children between all of these programs. Um, we make this happen through program fee subsidies, we serve food, we have transportation. Um, we really try to do whatever we can within our means to get every single child involved in something at Leisure Services. Um, we also serve children with diverse needs. Um, we serve children with physical needs such as asthma, allergies, uh, children who are in um, wheelchairs. We serve children with social emotional disorders. Um, with cognitive issues, uh, we've had refugee children participate in our after school and, and other programs. Um, our outreach efforts that Barb alluded to um, is one of the ways that we really try to um, make sure that everyone in our town has the ability to participate. We provide programs that are safe. Um, most of my programs are um, reg regulated by somebody. My after school program is overseen by the State Department of Early Education and Care. Uh, we're licensed by them. They come in unannounced uh, whenever they want. Um, and so we make sure that we're up to par, if not beyond par, uh, when it comes to the state regulations for after school. Uh, our summer day camps are um, inspected by the town and the health inspectors. And they, again, they come at the beginning of the summer and they can feel free to come one week or all seven weeks um, and make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to, if not more. Um, we try to promote caring about ourselves and others. 
positive growth emotionally and physically. We try to teach children to foster healthy relationships and encourage positive interactions with peers and adults. And we hope to be um, positive role models and mentors. Um, in order to accomplish these goals, we have many great partners. Barb talked about a bunch of them. I really kind of wanted to throw a shout out to the school system for many different reasons. They provide our housing for a lot of our programs. They help out with busing. Um, our school staff, at least the ones that I come in contact with, are really awesome people. Um, we partnered this past summer with um, the Mass Department of Education, uh, Elementary and Secondary Education, to provide breakfast and lunch. This was kind of huge, guys. Breakfast and lunch for all children in and our camps um, with partnering with the school system and with the state. Um, so anyone who was in not only our day camps but our sports camps uh, was able to have breakfast and lunch, which out of school time is really a hard time to make sure children eat. Um, Mill River was also a site for children who weren't involved in one of our programs. So we didn't really limit it just to sports and day camps, but Mill River was a site for anybody not involved in something uh, under age 18 to come down and get a lunch uh, three days out of the week. Um, we, we also work with the Family Center. Um, I, I can't leave without talking about UMass and Amherst College. Um, they work as our staff, uh, they work as our volunteers. Um, Barb talked about volunteer hours and how a lot of what we do really wouldn't be possible um, without them. And then lastly, I just kind of wanted to give a shout out to our staff. Um, our staff is comprised of not only the college students, but a lot of students that live and grew up in Amherst. Um, one of the full-time staff in our office, I remember meeting her at five, and now she's come full circle, and she actually works for Leisure Services as one of our outreach um, professionals. So um, we strive for a multicultural staff that mirrors the youth and uh, public we serve. Our staff are all CPR and first aid certified. Um, two of your uh, full-time staff are actually certified park and rec uh, professionals. So it means two of us in our office are certified on a national level. Uh, we took their tests, we took the requirements, um, and we do uh, yearly continuing education units to maintain uh, that certification. So I will turn it over to sports and Chris. Um, if you have any other questions, we can discuss it after. All right, thank you so much for taking the time to be with all of us. Um, kind of listen to what we have to do, how we contribute to this town. Uh, once again, my name is Chris Johnson, the sports director for Leisure Services in charge of all programs, uh, camps and events. Uh, my responsibilities are to effectively go turn towards me. Can't hear me back there. Uh, are to effectively collaborate uh, with the Amherst community, school departments, and various uh, town departments that we deal with. On top of you know UMass, uh, their Eisenberg School of Management, the volunteers, and uh, you know various individuals that apply for opportunities of work and employment that we have. Um, with all that together, you know our, our efforts are to ensure that we you know create a positive uh, approach to fitness health and, uh, and passion. Uh, we offer a wide variety of sports programs for youth and adults in town, uh, maintain all innovative standards by working effectively with, uh, with national associations such as USA Football, USA Volleyball, USA Basketball, Net Generation for Tennis, and the list goes, goes on, but um, the majority of those you know, that we work with allows us to you know, ensure safety, fun practice lessons, uh, and make sure that we're keeping up to date with um, you know, the national scale of, of how we're educating our, our kids within sports. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, all we want to try to do is, you know, produce positive results in the games, regardless of, you know, wins or losses. It's not about that. It's kind of the biggest thing that we try to promote. Um, one of our larger programs that we run um, is the National Ultimate Training Camp. We're actually in our 19th year. Uh, we work alongside with Tina Booth. She's, uh, you know, in the Hall of Fame for the national, on a national level. Uh, and she's our camp director. Um, in preparation for our 19th year, uh, for the national the training camp, we actually just, you know, got the bid submitted about last week. It will be over at Mount Holyoke. We're actually going to move forward with registration opening uh, this past Saturday. We've already seen an influx of people coming in, which has been great. So, um, but one thing is that, you know. Being one of the largest camps in the country, one of the most successful camps in the country, this is where if Tino was sitting in the back would interject and she'd say, no, we're actually, it's globally. Uh, we actually have kids coming in from Peru, uh, kids from Colombia, Germany, and other various countries internationally. 
which kind of makes it exciting for us and creates an experience for our campers. That's one of, one of a lifetime, so. Um, one thing that I briefly touched on was safety. Um, safety has been a large priority for our programming uh, in terms of making sure that we're up to date with our, our medical equipment, making sure that we're up to the standards of what we're allowed to do for our, our programs. But one of the you know, most important things that you know, we've kind of looked at as a whole is making sure that our, our facilities, our fields, and everything has been um, up to date. Um, you know, Barb and myself have been a part of this group, the Rex Working Group um, in town which is, you know, makes up of uh, various members of town department heads, um, the school department heads, uh, Rich Farrow, the athletic director, Sean Mangiano from the finance committee, getting together and really evaluating our recreational space and making sure that we're doing stuff effectively, looking long term, uh, working with DPW, if it's Guilford, Alan Snow, um, to make sure that we're moving forward in all the right aspects. So. Uh, about two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, that was established. Um, I'm, only, I'm actually only been here for a year and a half, so kind of hit the ground running when I came in with the group. But a consulting group was hired in, um, an innovative and design group, Weston and Sampson, um, out of Worcester. But they've taken the large scale of everything and really reevaluated everything to make sure that we're either have a master plan in order, make sure that our staging is, is correct moving forward, and make sure that our uh, our sourcing of what we're doing is right. So, um, I know if I didn't speak about this for the you know the sport community and for this group, you know they'd be saying, "What are you doing here?" You know. So I want to make sure that we touch down on it, and I know that they're really excited to hear your opinion on you know the master plan and the strategic planning moving forward with that. So uh, we have a lot of members in town. Our numbers stick true. So making sure that we're doing it in a safe way, that we're approaching the two main aspects of safety and accessibility is a very big priority for us. So once again, our goal is to use sports effectively as an outlet for youth and adults uh, and ensure that we're creating an opportunity for passion. On a larger scale, we want to make sure that everyone in town knows that they have this opportunity to participate and aim, as we aim to assist every child, young adult, in reaching their highest potential through athletic outlets uh, as we look to cultivate leadership, character development, or at the adult aspect, making sure that we're providing and continuing those passions. So that's where we are as a sports department. So thank you for listening. Are there questions? Yes, go ahead, so, please. I'll close it very quickly. As you can see, the sky is the limit, but the challenges are real. As the requirements from state and other oversight organizations increase, so do our challenges to meet or exceed those requirements. As minimum wage goes up, so do our costs. But we must ensure that every child in Amherst is able to participate, participate regardless of their ability to pay. Because in the end, LSSC is about making our community a better place to live in. And clearly, the opportunities are endless. So thank you very much. Do you have any questions? When is the chili challenge? Next Saturday the 9th. Okay. It's really good chili. I, you should come on down. <laughs> I've been there. Yeah, I can see you there. Are there other questions? Yes, Dorothy. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, Peter Pan was really great, and my granddaughter, who I've taken to the shows every year, was just jumping up and down and saying, this is the best, the absolute best. But, and we were very lucky because we originally had tickets for Sunday, and I had to change them to Saturday. So my question is, I know you had to cancel your Sunday performance because of the snow. Has that presenting you with a big problem financially? No, not uh, to date, not to my knowledge. And speaking, I've just had some conversations with the producers. Um, at their, they're just very generous people in Amherst, and uh, almost everybody donated <clears throat> the cost of their tickets back to the community theater. So thank you. George. Just a, a brief comment uh, really directed to my fellow counselors. I just want to make sure you know that currently serving on the council is a former youth basketball coach and a former soccer youth soccer coach of some standing, actually, um, <laughs> and who can speak uh, personally to the fine programs that LSSC runs, especially in the sports uh, end of things. And just, I only did baseball. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions? Yes, Kathy. 
Um, I, I live up in North Amherst, and actually our kids went to the summer camps all the time. I have a question on Cherry Hill. Um, to what extent is, I know Winterfests are done there, um, is the clubhouse winterized, so could the, can that be used for community events at all? You know, something you know, might be I, I don't know. Into. I know it's not open, but it's not winterized. If you per se, it's not very well insulated. So we do um, DPW um, basically turns off the water there, ensures that it doesn't freeze the water pipes. So we actually close it for a period and reopen for Winterfest. So we have, no, at this point, no. But it might be something we it, worth investigating, pursuing. Okay. Other questions? Thank you for all the fun you provide for Amherst. Thank you. Thank you guys. Great. I believe Senior so, Center is next. So as we migrate into the next, um, Madam Chair, um, yes. to our final presentation, so I just want to thank the counselors for devoting the amount of time that you have to these uh, presentations. Our departments and our staff really appreciate they work really hard and they prepare for these and they think it, they take it very seriously. Also, I want to mention that some of our, you know, many of our staff live in town. Some have grown up here. Chris grew up here. Um, Jeff Kravitz, who you heard, he grew up here. And so it's nice to have this connection. There's people who are working here for long periods of time who really invested in the community. And your next speaker will be a person who's worked here, um, Nancy, 45 years? 46. 46 years. So okay. she's a newbie, so be gentle on her. <laughs> I want to congratulate you on your election, and um, I appreciate you. Not used to being on the mic. <laughs> uh, I want to congratulate you on your election and um, staying here for what must have been a lot of information going into your head today. Thank you. The Emmer Senior Center in the Bangs Community Center is a precious jewel, in my opinion, in the town. It's a team effort. A team, the team is our staff, four full-time and two part-time, our Council on Aging advisory board with nine members, and our friends group, our nonprofit corporation that raises a good deal of the money we need. We have also a great number of volunteers, 184 in the last fiscal year. Our volunteers do everything they can to uh, answering the phone, helping with the financing, uh, teaching classes, delivering meals, that kind of thing. We are totally dependent on them. The Senior Center is a very busy place. We serve between 250 and 260 people every day. As far as our staff, I'm very fortunate to have two of our members here with me today. Um, and Helen will introduce herself to you. I'm Helen McMillan. I'm Program Director for Social Services. Hi, I'm Jennifer Reynolds. I'm the Administrative Assistant. So the Senior Center, um, I'm going to push the button here. Do this. Yeah. Ah, there we go. Okay. As you probably know, our population of older people is growing rapidly. Between the last two federal censuses, 20, 2000 and 2010, we grew 34.6% in the number of people 60 and over. And we project in 2020 that we will have grown another thousand or more people. Um, and so um, every day at the Senior Center, we enroll probably another 15 to 20 people. Um, and 25% of our people are from other communities. And people that come uh, are coming for the services, the recreation, and to be volunteers and to have their retirement enriched. We conduct a survey every 10 years, the Council on Aging, and in the last survey, we found that 75% of people who are 75 and older use the Senior Center. 96 read the newsletter, I brought samples for you. 
And most Amherst people want to stay in town as long as they possibly can. One of the most important focuses we have is food and nutrition and safety. And so we don't pay for any of the food we distribute. And in the pictures here, this is our lunch program, which has two components. It has the congregate meal and the home delivered meal, which is four routes around town in Amherst and Pelham. This program, like all our other food programs, has grown in the last year about another seven or eight percent. Um, Highland Valley Elder Services is our area agency on aging, a conduit of federal and state monies uh, in 28 towns in our area in Hampshire and Hamden County. And they are the ones that grant fund us for a nutrition program. We get a dollar for every meal that we serve or deliver, and that pays for the lunch site coordinator who's part-time. Helen is going to speak about a number of our other food programs. Well, I'll just go on to embellish about our UMass Meals on Wheels program. Uh, we're gr very lucky to have UMass uh, helping us out with that program. They have a community grant that pays for their staff time, and then we um, actually then charge our seniors for the actual cost of the food. So we get to send out their award-winning food every day. We deliver, well, between Kathy's program and the evening program, we send out 26,000 meals a year, evening meals. And also in-house, we serve uh, 16,000 lunches, uh, sitting down or delivered to the, delivered to the senior. Uh, UMass, um, everyone clamors for the UMass Meals on Wheels because I hear about that award-winning food. So Michelle and I have had to move to a, an evaluation system where we do do a health evaluation either over the phone or in person to make sure the senior truly needs it. Um, I, I recently had to remove someone from the program who was going to the gym, um, driving around town, and the volunteers were complaining to us that this is supposed to be frail homebound elders. So <laughs> I told that peppy senior they could call back when they're health declines again. Uh, we just came from the Wednesday Free Bread and Produce, which is a, a farmer's market. Um, that happens every Wednesday morning. We have donations from all the merchants, as you can see here. Um, one of the goals is to get um, organic produce, um, bread. We have some lovely bread donated out to seniors. We also do get meat and eggs. Uh, we try to keep everything healthy. Everyone wears gloves. It's quite a diverse group. Uh, one of the things I wanted to um, focus on when I came on board a few years ago as a program director is really getting more translation services at this program and other programs. So we have UMass students coming in who might speak uh, Spanish or Mandarin Chinese. Um, we also have some Portuguese people coming through. I have a trilingual nurse coming once a month, and she can flip between Spanish and Portuguese and English while she's doing blood pressure. Um, also, Jen has a contact with Kevin Zhao in parking, and so he's been helping us to move all our signage over to including Mandarin Chinese. It's very easy to find someone who speaks Spanish or Portuguese, but Mandarin Chinese, not so much, but he's been a huge help to us. And also, uh, the brown bag program, which is uh, food coming in. A big truck comes in once a month from the Western Mass Food Bank. All these programs are meant to help seniors. Um, really, a lot of these programs are not necessarily income eligible, but just for Amherst seniors. But it is meant to target people who might be in food stamps. And we spread these out over the month so that by the end of the month, everyone has access to food on pretty much a weekly basis to dovetail with their food stamps. Uh, Michelle Chamora, our other social worker, is unable to be here um, because we are so busy and don't have a huge amount of funding. I'm a half-time program director, half-time social worker. Michelle does full-time social work. When I came on board, uh, Nancy moved the senior center over to professional social workers, licensed social workers only on staff. So that's been a recent change. Uh, we also had to move away from walk-in, seniors just walking into appointments because we've gotten so busy. We're really very busy with the baby boomers, and the, we call it the tsunami of the baby boomers. We're just swarmed, swamped with people uh, coming in, so we really do have to be careful with our time. Um, later on, you'll see under the financial slide, uh, talk about our funding sources. 
One thing I did was write a Title III grant with Highland Valley. It's actually changed from a caregiver's grant to an aging across the spectrum grant. And that supports the caregiver support group, the LGBT programming, and also the um, grieving support group that Michelle runs. Um, and every year we've been able to do double the funding from Highland Valley, so we're very thankful to them. We're also moving into uh, bilingual um, with a Latinx social group, uh, Juana Trujillo, who many of you may know, retired from the Amherst Housing Authority, uh, came over and said, could you use me? And it took me a second to say yes. Uh, so she comes in twice a week. We're very lucky to have her volunteering to do bilingual program, uh, programming and outreach with um, the bilingual Spanish community. So that's been a wonderful addition. Some trends coming down for social services on a statewide level. Uh, there's some mandatory uh, legislation that will um, have all the local senior centers and boards have LGBTA awareness programming for all our boards and all our staff. So that'll be coming down the line. That'll be provided by the state. Also, statewide efforts are dementia-friendly programming and also age-friendly programming. Uh, Charlie Baker's own mother has dementia, so he's very aware of uh, senior services and the needs. So there will be more money coming down the pike attached to these programs. And another key one, just to point out, is the Tax Work Off program. That's a wonderful program to offer uh, seniors in the area who are finding the uh, real estate taxes much too high. Uh, each senior that's eligible for the program, it is an income eligibility program, um, can earn up to $1,500 a year off their real estate taxes. So that's a wonderful benefit for seniors. It's a huge relief. And if there's a couple in the house, they could each work uh, fit for the $1,500. So that would be $3,000 off their tax bill. That makes a big difference for someone that wants to stay in their home and age in place. It's also a wonderful source of volunteers. Uh, they often work at the library, some at Town Hall, and a lot at the Senior Center. Uh, most of them, when they've worked their hours and earned their $1,500, don't go away. They stay around and they continue the volunteer, and they're terrific. Um, so they're a big help to the Senior Center. We're very proud of our, sorry. We're very proud of our Senior Health Services Program. The School of Nursing at the University and students and faculty got a federal grant back in 1979 to provide health services at the Senior Center, and that grant continued until 1988. And one of the faculty at the, nurse, uh, the School of Nursing um, was incredibly uh, committed to having, when the grant ran out, to continuing uh, the program. So she searched in the community and found um, some very benevolent community members, a husband and wife, who um, agreed to donate $10,000 a year, which they have done now. They've already donated 180000 to keep the nursing center going. There's no town money in the nursing center. Do um, write grants now and then to help with supporting it. and. Uh, we are so lucky to have the head of the, of the senior health services to also have her PhD in nursing. So it's a wonderful uh, set of services she offers back both at the senior center and clinics in the Clark House and home visits um, to really help people to, to um, feel that they can manage whatever their health issues are. She sees about 15 people a day on, on average. We have a, you probably have seen our newsletter, I brought some copies. We have a wide range of, of recreational and educational activities, about 19 fitness and dance classes, numerous seminars and parties and trips and that kind of thing. Uh, we try to keep everything very low cost. And when there is an instructor that requires a fee, um, the various participants pay the small fee to, to go to the event. Many of the instructors then turn around and give us that money as a donation. We manage to keep going with our donations. We have a travel program, which, which is a good fundraiser for the Senior Center. It's self-supporting and uh, provides a lot of fun and a chance to get out of town. And I'm sure you can appreciate that that sometimes is important. 
I would say a majority of the people we serve are living alone and um, have lost a number of their family and friends, and this is an opportunity to just have a happier existence. Some of our activities are um, in, the, in the same room as other activities. Uh, we're a little cramped for space, and the, the pictures on the right there are games played in our computer room, so when those are going on, there can't be use of the computers. And then, of course, using the computer, this is not advancing, uh, using the computers is, is very important these days. <coughs> Uh, well, try it. Oh. oh, okay, okay. Sorry. So when they're not playing games, they're using the computer. We have free individual tutoring, um, which is a very popular event. One of our largest programs is our convalescent uh, loan and repair program. Um, that program, we loaned in FY18 322 pieces of equipment. Um, it's very much appreciated in the community. Most of the equipment is donated to us. Uh, we've bought some, the friends have paid for some equipment. Um, the Amherst Women's Club has donated money toward wheelchairs and that kind of thing. Um, this is a very important program. Other services of the Senior Center, the newsletter, which is we found from our survey, read by a huge portion of people um, that get it. It goes for free to everyone in town when they are in their 59th year or older. It's 16 pages long. It's also online. Our income tax assistance program is incredibly popular. Right now, we're taking appointments, um, and it starts tomorrow, and it goes through the middle of April, obviously. Health insurance, which is a nightmare for people to wade through. We have counselors that come in uh, usually twice a month. We have an attorney that comes um, once a month, and a whole number of individual health clinics by other nurses than our uh, senior health service di our director. Um, we have a partnership with the police and the fire and the sheriff's office, the SALT Council. So we uh, are the conduit for requests in the community for house numbers, home safety inspections, and carbon monoxide detectors. Um, I try to also use student groups to help with yard work, leaf raking and snow shoveling, although this year it's been more difficult to, to get that help because, you know, intercession people are gone. But uh, we do try to help people in what other, well, any way that they, they need. The senior center tries to be the family that's not nearby and the friend that they need to talk to. And we try to help in any way we can, whether it's picking up medicine for people that they can't get to the pharmacy, that kind of thing. We have discounted PVTA van tickets. Um, the Town of Amherst Transportation uh, Program uh, Committee uh, reduces the price of the tickets. The tickets are, um, for Amherst residents, $3 each way. And um, it's, have, oh, okay, okay. These are just some of the activities. The financing, um, we have money from the town, grants um, from uh, the state, and Highland Valley, those are all listed there. And of course, a lot of donations. Friends Group is our main fundraising um, nonprofit corporation, and, and they um, take care of any program expenses we have because we don't have program money from the town. This is a little pie chart, chart on that. Our biggest challenges are pretty straightforward. Everyone knows about parking issues. We suffer from that. And um, we need more people if we're going to provide the services that are um, like other senior centers and are in high demand. So we appreciate our space the town pays for. And our computers and phones, we don't have to pay for that. So we are very fortunate in that regard. Thank you very much for allowing us to speak. If you have any questions, 
Um, I, I should have Jen also mention one thing she does. You probably, some of you have been in touch with her to reserve space in the Bangs Community Center, which is a very busy place. Maybe you could mention how many um, requests there were last year. Uh, last year we had 3,580 reservations in our rooms in the building, which is a high number. They're all nonprofits. Um, we also, in addition to our programs that we do it for Mass Rehab, who's trying to connect people to jobs again that had been injured previously, or ServiceNet, um, PVTA, they meet people there to be qualified for the ADA transport. Um, so there's a lot of nonprofit groups that are in and out of there every day that we also serve. You may recognize Jen because she was working for the parking department for 10 years before right. we were lucky enough to, right. to have her start with us last, okay. last year. See? And she handles all our money. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Are there questions? Just so you know, we, you are well represented for seniors on the council. <laughs> Some of us hit that age mark a couple years ago. <laughs> I'd like to also mention our Council on Aging president, Rosemary Koffler, is here. Um, they're incredibly supportive of our mission, and we really couldn't do it without them. Thank you. Yeah, our board actually serves as receptionists and uh, handles many, many direct service um, uh, things going on in the senior center every day, including going down two floors to get convalescent equipment, which is a big part of our day. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on with the rest of our presentation, but thanks for your services. Thank you very much. Paul, did you have a, no, okay. Uh, we have no appointments, approval of minutes, or committee reports at this time. I do want to offer people the opportunity for public comment. Is there anyone that would like to make a comment? Okay, see none. Um, any counselor comments at this time? Must be hungry. Um, so with that, I move to adjourn. Is there a second? George? Is your second? All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you.